Starting in April of 2007, I went out on a mission. A mission to answer a simple question. What is the difference between a spiritual awakening and bipolar disorder? And now, finally, after almost three years of research, thousands of emails and comments, and 20 consecutive slideshow videos on this subject alone, I can finally share with you my definitive answer. And that answer is that I've been asking the wrong question. However, as you'll see, by figuring out that I was asking the wrong question, I eventually stumbled upon the right one. And with that, I think I've come across an absolute breakthrough with regards to how, as a society, we view both bipolar disorder and spiritual experiences. A breakthrough that could eventually lead to the healing of thousands of people, not only from bipolar disorder, but from schizophrenia and many other mental disorders. So what this video is really about is how I went from asking the wrong question to asking the right one. You see, before I knew anything about bipolar disorder, I had searched for a clinical understanding of my own spiritual awakening shortly after it happened about 10 years ago. It was then that I discovered the work of Dr. Stan Groff, and for Groff, there was a condition that looked very much like mental illness, but could actually lead to a spiritual breakthrough, which is what I had, and he called this condition a spiritual emergency. In reading his book, The Stormy Search for the Self, I finally found some validation for my spiritual experience, something that few others were willing to believe, that what I had been through was indeed spiritual and not a mental illness. And in the back of this book, he had an appendix to help people determine the difference between a mental illness like schizophrenia and a true spiritual emergency. So here are some of the criteria for a spiritual emergency. First, exams show no pathology or disease affecting the brain. The intellect and memory are challenged but intact. Adequate pre-episode social functioning and healthy relationships. Enough trust to be able to communicate and cooperate with others during the episode. And conversely, there should be an absence of self-destructive behavior, aggressive behavior, or withdrawal from help. The person in a spiritual emergency could also have the feeling that something important, healing, and even spiritual is happening. Spiritual themes such as birth and death are also present in an experience of spiritual emergency. And so because my experience met all of Groff's criteria, I went for over a decade thinking that my experience and that of people with mental illness were completely different. However, when my niece Anna had an experience in 2007, I was struck by how similar it was to my own and became convinced that she was having a spiritual emergency, even though her psychiatrist was medicating her for what he saw as a mental illness, most likely bipolar disorder. It was then that I started this research project as well as making YouTube videos to share my story. Once the comments started rolling in, I realized that thousands of people labeled with bipolar disorder had stories similar to my own and fit Groff's criteria for a spiritual emergency. And not only that, but once I started producing theory videos explaining what actually happens to someone when they're in a spiritual emergency, I realized that many of us were going through the same deeply spiritual themes while we were in this apparent insanity. Both a spiritual emergency and bipolar mania can have a feeling of cosmic oneness to it, a feeling of timelessness. You may feel you have all-knowing universal knowledge or a deep sense of sacredness. There can be spiritual visions or voices, or as psychiatrists call them, hallucinations. You may think that you're dreaming or in a movie, that you're being tested by God, that you're the Messiah, a prophet, or a saint, or that you're dead, dying, or being reborn. And these are just a few of the very common spiritual experiences that many bipolar people identified with in my videos. However, some bipolar people did not identify with these experiences at all. Not only did these people hate my videos, but they also hated me for making them. What is so spiritual about wanting to kill my cats? One guy asked me. You're going to have to answer to Jesus for this, said one woman. Apparently, for some people, bipolar mania had been almost an anti-spiritual experience. Some people suffered from very demonic hallucinations. Others endured severe paranoia or deep feelings of anger. For me, these people seemed to be encountering experiences that I'd always considered to be closer to schizophrenia. But perhaps what was most common was not these highly positive spiritual experiences or the deeply fearful, painful experience. No, what was most common was a mixed episode. 
Most people would experience both ends of the spectrum, the love and the fear, the joy and the pain, the good and the evil. It seemed to me that rather than being a separation between spiritual emergencies and bipolar disorder, there was a spectrum of experiences from those dominated by love to those dominated by fear. With most people having a type of mixed episode which would lie somewhere in the middle, a mix of love and fear. And not only that, but this spectrum would go from spiritual emergencies to bipolar disorder all the way to schizophrenia with no definitive break between the three. And so it's in this way that I became convinced that three experiences which I was sure were completely separate from each other were actually all part of the same spectrum of experience. And that's when I realized that my original question was going nowhere because I was never going to find a clear, distinct line between a spiritual awakening and bipolar disorder. But it was in realizing that I needed to change direction that I went from asking the wrong question to asking the right one. And that question is, if experiences of spiritual emergency, bipolar mania, and schizophrenia are all part of the same spectrum, then what are the key factors which would lead to someone having a more positive, negative, or mixed episode of psychosis? And it's that question that I intend to answer in part two of this video. Now, as luck would have it, back during the time I was studying Stan Groff's stuff, I was also studying Ken Wilbur. And it's with Wilbur that I learned about another type of spectrum what he called the spectrum of consciousness. And as it turns out, just as people in psychosis have experiences ranging from the very fearful to the very loving, according to Wilbur, we actually evolve from more closed, fearful levels of consciousness to more open, loving levels of consciousness. And so in recognizing this parallel between the spectrum of psychosis and the spectrum of consciousness, I started to wonder if they would somehow match up Meaning, would people at a higher, more loving level of consciousness have more spiritual emergency type of psychosis? Would the people at the lower levels have more fearful, schizophrenic type psychosis? And most importantly, would the people in the middle have more mixed episodes, the typical type of bipolar psychosis? Now, in order to see if this theory had any useful value to it, the toughest part for me was going to be determining if schizophrenia was connected to the lowest levels of consciousness. And this was mainly because I didn't have a lot of contact with people who had severe schizophrenia, the type of people who might spend many months or years in psychiatric institutions. However, after a few years of research and a lot of reading, I did find that there are a number of similarities between the way people at lower levels of consciousness think and the way people with schizophrenia think. Now along with the very fearful life experience that I've already talked about, probably the most obvious and important similarity is that both groups have hallucinations. In fact, there's a very interesting book by a guy named Julian Jaynes called The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And in this book, he explains how people, not only at the tribal level of consciousness, but also at the earliest levels of civilization, people in the feudal level, were not directed by their own mind, but by the commanding visions and voices of the gods. In fact, visions and voices were common in ancient Egypt, Greece, India, and among tribal peoples around the world. Proof of the commonplace nature of these occurrences can be found in the earliest books of the Old Testament, parts of the Greek Iliad, and the Hindu Vedas as well. In fact, hallucinations were so pervasive in these more primitive civilizations that Jaynes writes, according to our theory, we could say that before the second millennium BC, everyone was schizophrenic. And just like with primitive peoples, when someone with schizophrenia has a hallucination, they interpret that vision or voice concretely, never symbolically. So that angel that they see or hear appears to them as real as the hand in front of your face. And because of this concrete way of interpreting reality, when people at these levels have a God experience, it's very common for them to think that they are the exact reincarnation of Jesus Christ, having power over others. Now I know this may seem highly irrational, but you need to understand that in both groups, reality is seen as an entirely magical place. Because, as I explained in my videos on tribal consciousness, the inner world and the outer world are fused together, making both schizophrenics and tribal people highly superstitious. 
And so with a mind that works like this, it's no wonder that both groups have a deep fear and respect for evil spirits, devils, and demons. It truly is a mind where any fears that you have are brought to life. So overall, whether someone is at a lower level of consciousness or they're suffering from schizophrenia, we're really seeing someone who's living in their own world, someone who sees the world from one perspective. The movie The Soloist, starring Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr., gives a very honest look at how isolated this one perspective reality can be. There, Fox plays a former musician who now lives in a world of shadows and potential threats due to his schizophrenia. And as you'll see, the one perspective reality makes it very difficult for him to maintain any relationships because it's almost impossible for him to consider other people's thoughts and feelings when he makes decisions or takes action. So, considering all of these similarities, I think it's safe to say that we've got a clear connection between the type of psychosis associated with schizophrenia and the lower levels of consciousness. Now, the question was, would I find a similar relationship at the higher end of the spectrum? Well, to start, the power of now level and the postmodern level are the most open, loving levels of consciousness in the model. These levels also have a much more spiritual but non-religious view of life, which parallels the insistence of many people in spiritual emergencies that they're in fact going through a spiritual experience. These are also the most intuitive levels of consciousness, where people often override their purely rational, logical thinking and trust their intuitive feeling for things instead. And this ties in with the intuitive interpretation that people give when they're having a spiritual emergency, that they're going through something very important, some inexplicable inner process which must be completed. Both groups also see reality as being deeply meaningful on a symbolic level. They will think, well, this looks like a hotel, but it feels like purgatory. Or he looks like a security guard, but he seems like an angel. As a result, rather than being bombarded with the disturbing concrete thoughts and hallucinations of schizophrenia, People in a spiritual emergency are often quite pleasantly surprised by startling synchronicities, especially receiving messages from the television, music, or other symbolic communications which seem specifically designed for them. But of course, as people at the higher levels of consciousness know, synchronicities aren't just for people that are in experiences of psychosis. Many postmodern spiritual books like the Celestine Prophecy discuss the importance of synchronicities in our daily lives. Global issues such as poverty, the environment, war, or racism could all surface when somebody is in the middle of a spiritual emergency, and these are issues that increase in personal importance as you get into the higher levels of consciousness. And finally, as opposed to the one perspective thinking of schizophrenia, many people in spiritual emergencies are already thinking in a postmodern, multiple perspective way of seeing things. To give one example, my favorite stories of so-called psychosis come from former atheists who open up to seeing life from different perspectives once they're hit with a powerful spiritual emergency. So once again it appears that we have a lot of compelling evidence for connecting the more positive spiritual experiences of a spiritual emergency with the higher levels of consciousness. Okay, so what would connect the middle, traditional, and modern levels of consciousness to the type of psychosis usually diagnosed as bipolar mania? Well, based on my research, I would say that the main characteristic at this level is confusion. Being bipolar is confusing for a couple of reasons. First, like I said, you're most likely having a mixed episode. You're having experiences of love expressed through cosmic oneness, timelessness, and a sense of all-knowingness, just to give a few examples. But on the other hand, it can be very frightening as well, as many people experience moments of paranoia, even hallucinations, and regressions into trauma, which can be quite painful. And then, of course, there's the drugs, which don't help much either. For most people with bipolar disorder, drug experiences, usually with marijuana or LSD, have been a part of what triggered their first episode. So for yourself and others, it may be hard to separate the effects of the drug from the psychosis itself. Another source of confusion is simply the way people think at these levels of consciousness. You see, as we evolve from the magical concrete lower levels to the symbolic intuitive higher levels, the middle levels, particularly the modern level, is much more factual and logical. And as a result, any inner experiences we happen to be going through are invalidated, they're denied, because they can't be measured. If you're at the modern level, everyone will have you believing that your disorder is caused by a chemical imbalance, even though the scientific evidence will show that you're biologically normal. 
At the traditional level, people might see you as having a moral flaw, like God is punishing you for something you did. But either way, regardless of how you felt about your experience on the other side, people at these two middle levels of consciousness will work to convince you that these experiences are bad and better off forgotten. And if you're at those middle levels, you'll probably believe them. So once again, we find a lot of compelling evidence demonstrating that a typical bipolar psychosis usually fits within the modern and traditional levels of consciousness, especially because at this stage of development, any spiritual experiences we go through are denied, first by our society, then by ourselves. Schizophrenia, bipolar mania, spiritual emergencies. The spectrum of psychosis matches seamlessly with the spectrum of consciousness. Now just recognizing this relationship will be a huge step forward for both psychiatry and psychology. But before I explain why, I need to add one more very important factor to our model. A factor that will also help us understand why it's much easier for some people to heal from psychosis than others. And that missing factor is trauma. When diving into the ocean of your own soul, it helps to know what lies beneath the surface. Maybe that water is crystal clear, but maybe it's full of sea monsters. Now either way, it's always a hero's journey, but when you know those waters are especially dark and dangerous, it helps to know what might be in store for you. And that's why having some idea of your own degree of life trauma is especially important before you take the plunge. Now normally most people think of trauma as related to child abuse, and that is by far the most damaging form of trauma that I've come across. However, as I talked about in my video on trauma, it can come in surprising forms. Experiences from any time in our lives can have a powerful effect on us, such as witnessing a murder or being in a fire. But we can also be affected by traumatic events which we have no conscious memory of, like being an unwanted pregnancy. But regardless of the shape these traumas take, there does seem to be a general rule, which is that the more traumatic your life experience is, the more difficult your experience on the other side will be. You see, once you're into the so-called psychosis, there is a tremendous opportunity to heal the wounds you carry from those experiences in life that you would rather forget, or may have completely forgotten. However, before the healing can take place, there's a catch. And that catch is that you need to re-experience the trauma first. And that's the hard part. You see, as long as that sea monster is swimming in the deep, he's outside of your awareness, even though he's always there. In order to get rid of him, you need to let him come to the surface, where you can see and feel all of his ugliness in the light of day. And it's in this process of allowing our sea monsters, or our traumas, to become completely conscious emotionally and intellectually that they finally disappear. Now the good news in all of this is that during the acute psychosis it's often possible to rid yourself of painful experiences which may have haunted you for years and this can happen in just a matter of hours or even minutes. All that needs to take place is that you need to open yourself emotionally to what you're feeling inside and that can be a scary thing because some of the energies connected to these traumas can be very powerful. It's not uncommon for people to be crying, screaming, or even blacking out when these experiences happen. And so for many people in this situation, sensing the emotional pain and memories arising within, it's tempting to simply try and block whatever's happening within you. Playing loud music, talking non-stop, or even doubling up on the meds. But for the true healing to take place, you really need to let go. And so because trauma is such an important factor to consider, I've added it to the model here because, as I said, all things being equal, the more trauma that is within you, the more difficult and fearful your process will be. And so that's why on the left I'm connecting heavy trauma with high fear, and on the right, light trauma with low fear. And if you take a look at my video on hallucinations, you'll see that I've already found a relationship between a heavy amount of trauma and schizophrenia. And it should come as no surprise that the people at the opposite end of the spectrum, those having the very positive spiritual experiences, had very few difficult traumas to deal with in their experience of psychosis or in their life history. 
Now, I'm sure there are many people out there with bipolar disorder that don't consider their lives to be particularly traumatic, and that may be the case. However, there is one other type of trapped energy which we carry within us that needs to surface when you're in a typical manic psychosis, and that is the energy of repressions. You see, as we move from the one perspective reality of the feudal level into the two perspective world of the traditional level, we learn to repress our emotions. Now, as I talked about in a previous video, learning to repress emotions is an important skill as it helps you get along with people better. However, some people become overly repressed, feeling that they can never truly be themselves. That's why I've called bipolar disorder, I can't be me disorder. And based on the people I've talked to, I would say that it's the repression of your true self or inner spirit, which is often a big part of why people go into psychosis. So you see, as opposed to someone with very deep psychological problems who's perhaps had a lifetime of difficulties relating to people, many people with bipolar disorder were in fact the opposite. Top of their class, straight A students, popular and charismatic. It's just that perhaps the expectations they felt they needed to live up to may have become too much for them or in fact didn't really reflect who they were as a person. So as opposed to being in the more traumatized lower left-hand corner of our chart, most of the people diagnosed with bipolar disorder that I've talked to would find themselves towards the upper right, dealing with some trauma but also a fair amount of emotional repression. Now some of you might be asking, if people in the far upper right hand corner are already at a higher level of consciousness and have less trauma or repressions to deal with than others, then why would they enter into a psychosis at all? Well, starting with the modern level of consciousness, we begin to question our own reality. And at first, we challenge the thinking of our culture, questioning our religious beliefs, cultural obligations, or even superstitions that might be left over from the lower levels. But at the postmodern level, we begin to question everything, even our own rational mind. Here, the world somehow opens up, and the sense of wonder we had as children returns, especially as we begin to see how our own thoughts, feelings, and attitudes directly impact or even help create our own reality. And so, in order to create a better world for themselves, people become much more introspective at the postmodern level, questioning the limitations of their own consciousness in order for them to improve. As a result, people in or near the postmodern level are often enthusiastically involved in activities which, whether they know it or not, put them on a course for breaking out of their own ego or false self and possibly into a very positive spiritual psychosis or spiritual emergency. Now these activities may include intensive self-help seminars, spiritual retreats, reading a very inspiring book could be a trigger, or even foreign travel in the name of finding yourself. Pretty much any highly stimulating thought-provoking activity could be part of the ego-breaking triggers that takes you into psychosis, including watching videos from bipolar or waking up. Now, are traumas and repression still a factor here? Sure they are. It's just that for those in the upper right, the psychosis they find themselves in is often caused, quite accidentally, by their own efforts to expand their level of consciousness. And this brings me to another interesting aspect of this model, because based on the people I've talked to, it seems to me that when it comes to the life circumstances or triggers which cause someone to go into their first psychosis, the people in the upper right usually have many triggers happening, while those in the lower left have few, if any. For example, a typical upper right bipolar psychosis involves moving away to university. The combination of a new school in a new city, being away from family and old friends, being introduced to new ideas, and then maybe seeing your grades drop, plus smoking a lot of marijuana, this combination of triggers could initiate a psychosis in just about anybody. On the other hand, someone hallucinating devils at the age of 14 or 15 may not be able to remember any specific triggers causing their first episode. So as opposed to people on the upper right, who usually have many triggers to their first acute psychosis, those on the lower left usually only have one or two, as it's the severity of the trauma that they've been through that is primarily responsible for their first episode. So, it's been a long journey, but a satisfying one, because I think I finally got a pretty good answer to my question. 
If you remember from part one, I started out looking for the difference between a spiritual awakening and bipolar disorder, but then in realizing that there was actually no definitive separation between a spiritual awakening or a spiritual emergency, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, I then asked what are the key factors which would lead to someone having a more positive, negative, or mixed episode of psychosis. And those key factors turned out to be consciousness and trauma. And knowing this, we can start to look at the spectrum of psychosis in a whole new way. You see, it's important to remember that up until now, according to psychiatry, all episodes of acute psychosis should be medicated, and most people become medicated for life. And that even among the most open-minded psychiatrists and psychologists, there's been a genuine frustration in the inability to clearly define a spiritual experience from insanity. However, what our model shows is that there will never be a clear diagnostic criteria to separate one experience from the other. And so rather than looking at these experiences in black and white terms of spiritual or insanity, we can now assess someone's probability of healing based on our model. And what we'll find is that for people approaching the upper right hand side, there will be a high probability of having healing, even spiritual breakthroughs. Having much more fearful, traumatic experiences, those people in the lower left hand side of the model will have a lower probability of healing as it's much more difficult for those people to engage the material that they're confronted with. And as for people labeled with bipolar disorder, as always, they fall somewhere in the middle, usually having mixed episodes of love and fear. And for these people, their probability of healing can be good, provided that they're given the education and support necessary to help them work through their processes. Because in truth, wherever you would find yourself in this model, every acute psychosis has at least the potential of transforming into a spiritually healing experience. My new book, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up? by me, Sean Blackwell, is now available at Amazon.com. For more details, check out my new website at BipolarOrWakingUp.com. Español, inglés, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciré ich nur videos en English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. 
I am sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my fir the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, e explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. O da trinkgeld en restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también 
copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Adress-Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mi video antigo. English, Espanol. Video mix number 25, video mix numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice, Court, Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW, que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag 
ya he hecho varios vídeos sobre este hashtag vid but this time especially thinking of my last video number 24 uh, robot ethics pero esta vez especialmente pensando en mi último video uh, video mix número 24 robot ethics e ética de robots First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons Treehouse of Horror number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el, epi el episodio de Simpsons número 13, Treehouse of Horror número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more of uh, Simpsons, many years now. Es asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons en la televisión española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? ¿Has oído de, del término Simpsonología? O Simpson, Simpson, Simpsonology. Simpson, Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía no. Long story short, the moral of the this episode of The Simpsons, the animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number Video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny gif. GIF is abbreviation for graphic interchange format. Y con un gracioso GIF. GIF. Maybe it's a little bit helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo simp simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo 
todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. El copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copiar. copiar. Law of intellectual property. La ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix. Uh, me enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente el, especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you get more and more doubts. Y si continuas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que creado el hashtag JCCVW, Just, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia, Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Manos Enigma, the cover picture, uh, I've got written Justice, who has the right to judge? Who is without sin cast the first stone? Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo um, a cover, um, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién está sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. In normal legal system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la, la pregunta es, ¿es legal o es ilegal? But it's more important to ask, is it, is it ethical, is it right or is it wrong? Es más importante preguntar es está bien o mal es ético no no es ético. Did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término ahora no sé en español pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que 
Ejemplo, no culpable porque la ley es injusta. You have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just unjust. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty que quiere decir el, el gatito inocente de criptografía. But it's medical catnip. Pero es catnip médico. 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin, dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner, a very interesting case too, and one interview, um, I made a video, um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, I think it's the video mix number. Yes, I had just a look at video mix number 17. Justo he mirado es el video mix número 17 con Charlie Shrem. This comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Pasted here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos voy a pegar en este momento. And, uh, podcast can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can Rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet there's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction, selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents, gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop, even if you're unarmed. And 
where cities run effectively debtors' prisons, where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail for violating subpoenas and things like that, and run it as a for-profit enterprise. And then in the middle is the middle class, caught in this justice system, this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom. And the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities, but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, Some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime, with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time. Bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's, it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It's just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's, it's, it's not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's, a, it's an overall, you see it, you see it with everything. I mean, look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace. But once they have their sights on you, telling it's you per se, I think it's what you represent or who you are. Um, there's no getting out of those sites. And the higher up you are, the harder it is for them to prosecute you. It just doesn't make sense for them. Our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today. And I created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, or maybe a better hashtag Let's Talk Ethics. I also created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, Let's Talk Justice, but perhaps better Let's Talk Ethics, Let's Talk Justice. After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar 
un pequeño vídeo en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español. I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. No, eh, perdón, español ahora. Eh, comparación del episodio de Simpson Treehouse of Horror número 13. Comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system, of course, there is no such thing like judgment, rather a uh, fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio, más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recorda que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game, traducido Juego de Negocios de Almas. Es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life. Especially interesting for cats and blind people. Especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos. O people blind o people who have problems with the eyes. The bra. Anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De todas formas, mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Cat. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que... Veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Uh, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to, to um, participate in a trial lawsuit uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast. You have to take vacation. You have to buy a flight to New York. And I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, renalification, en español no me acuerdo, so no estoy segura, pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira, yo estoy, uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable.
Así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones, comprar un vuelo a Nueva York. Y eh, era ese juicio, me parece, era en, en enero, cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system with uh, hashtag JCCVW, this is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong. Don't need to buy a flight to New York. Uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal, no, eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales, no hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética. Puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P, and especially talking about robot ethics, this will be very important in the future. Y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to Uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot. So now I'll paste the, these two videos. Así que ahora voy a pegar estos dos videos.